visible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before or above all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. The Apostle Paul is amazed at the what of Jesus. What is Jesus? Jesus is the son of his father, the God of the universe. Jesus, <coughs> Jesus is the uh, is the one in whom we find redemption. Jesus is the one who is the example, the portrayal of that invisible God. Jesus is the one who created all in heaven and created all in earth. Jesus is the one who is over all dominions and principalities and powers. Jesus is the authority in everything, ultimately. And all have to come to him and face him in judgment for how they have handled the responsibilities given to them. Jesus is the head of the church. And Jesus is the one who has the preeminence in all things. Jesus has been given the position of being the highest being in all the universe. And Jesus is the one who made peace between sinful human beings, rebellious human beings, and, and God. And Jesus is the one who resolves that problem of alienation, that problem of separation, and brings the two of us together. Jesus is the one who because of his death and because of his life can make us appear before the throne of heaven unblameable and unreprovable and that's probably the most amazing uh, what about Jesus. Today as we come to the communion service we do so because we want to remind ourselves about Jesus. We want to remind ourselves about some great quality that Jesus has that is so essential to our salvation. And there's no way at all that anyone will be saved for eternal life, saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the inevitable eternal death that we are all bound by. There's no way that we will ever be uh, saved from that except through the merits of Jesus. And by that I mean that thing about Jesus which makes him so superior to every other being. And that superiority rests in the fact that Jesus has an absolute purity. And we talked a little bit about this in the Sabbath school for a moment or two this morning. And I find it very hard to understand how Jesus could live his life for 33 years in this world and uh, maintain an absolute purity. And if Jesus ever tripped over something, he never said a bad word. And when people were insulting to him, he never thought a bad, revengeful thought. And I find that hard because it's so natural for me when I trip over something to say some of the words that I heard my father say and my grandfather say, which are not a good expression of what's inside. It's an expression of frustration and anger and, uh, and poor me. But Jesus never gave any expression of the poor me that you and I so frequently express. How easy it is for us to give expression to our natural, sinful, human um, nature and how often we do it. We do it so often in subtle ways we probably just have it as part of our being. 
and it's done without even our knowledge very often. I mean, occasionally, of course, you feel like blowing your top, and perhaps sometimes we do blow our top, and afterwards we say, we shouldn't have done that. We knew that wasn't the right way to go. <coughs> but then there's a lot of other things that we just seem to do by, by habit or by nature that we would never do if we had the purity and the holiness of Jesus. If we had what Jesus had, we'd never do it. I wonder how Jesus could go for those years uh, <coughs> watching the development or the decline of the human race from Adam down through the ages. Jesus watched the decline of the human race, people falling into gross sins and gross immorality, um, in no way representing the purity and the holiness that God had put into humanity in the first place when he created them and moving further and further away from God even to the point where they would sacrifice their own children, thinking in some way God was a God who loved to see children killed. There's still some parts of the world where people have no respect for children. There's some parts in our society even where people have no respect for children. And how can Jesus see all that and not feel some of the emotion and not express some of the emotion that I would express uh, towards it? And uh, just for an example, the other day someone was talking about uh, some terrible crime that had been committed and I suggested a solution uh, as far as I thought justice was concerned. It didn't resolve the problem with the people being killed but it certainly made sure that this, um, this criminal didn't kill anybody ever again and I thought the quick answer was of course the firing squad or something equally as effective. And my mind immediately said, well, he should be destroyed and that's it. But uh, on thinking about it, I thought to myself, maybe the man should be at least given the opportunity of knowledge and the opportunity of repentance. And if that didn't work, maybe the, um, the radical solution is the way to go. But uh, as Jesus looked down through the history of the world, um, his response was always one of justice and fairness and of understanding. His mind was so pure that he could think in terms of the ultimate in holiness and what was the best for the human race. But I think back beyond that and I think of Jesus in uh, the heavenly realms where sometime in the eons past, one of his favorite beings, the one to whom he gave great uh, authority and responsibility. Lucifer turned against him and started to accuse him. And Lucifer is there accusing Jesus of being selfish, Jesus of being unfair, Jesus of withholding um, good things from the angels. And uh, Jesus has to go through this. How long it went on for, we don't know. Maybe it went on for hundreds of years, we don't know. And Jesus worked with Lucifer and worked with those angels who should sort of uh, listen to Lucifer. And it may have taken hundreds of years before Jesus eventually said, Lucifer, heaven is no place for you. You're not happy in heaven. It's time that you went somewhere else. And he said, you'll have to go out there into the realms of the, the biblical term is the abyss. You'll have to go out into the world of emptiness. And if you go out into the world of emptiness, you'll have time to think about uh, what heaven is really like and what the benefits of heaven and my creation is really like. And so Satan was thrown out of heaven and eventually he came down to this earth. And uh, <coughs> he, he made his presence felt here. And Jesus is looking all at, at that. And not for one moment is Jesus feeling revengeful or harsh or cruel. Just think of what he could have thought. Just think of how you and I would respond. You see, Jesus is different. And so the qualities of Jesus are mentioned here by the Apostle Paul. Um, the real inner part of Jesus. Paul is not describing how he looks. He's not describing how he walks. He's not describing the, the accent with which he speaks. He's not describing whether or not Jesus is, uh, is uh, um, taller or shorter than the average people around him or whether he could lift a bigger weight uh, than those around him or whether he could run further or whether he could go longer without food or whatever. He's not talking about those sort of things because those are peripheral to the big picture. Jesus, uh, Paul is talking about Jesus' real worth, what he really is. And Jesus, in Paul's sight, is undescribable. 
He uses terms that we can understand to some degree, but it seems as though he's really run out of words. And so he portrays Jesus the best way he can as the one with all purity, the one with all power, and the one with all authority, but the one with all compassion. And of all those attributes, I think you and I like the last one the best, don't we? We're not so concerned about the power because we realise how, how uh, feeble we really are. And uh, we're not so worried about the other aspects, but this compassion word, this compassion thing, that's the one we like, isn't it? We like people to show us compassion. And we want the God of the universe to show us compassion. We want Jesus who's been assigned to deal with the problem of sin in this world and to deal with you and I. We want him to be a compassionate being. And how hard we find it to always act with compassion. But Jesus did so because it was in him. It was him. Jesus was always compassionate. And I believe that uh, we want to see Jesus today as the creator and as the redeemer characterized by compassion. And as Jesus looked at all those developments that led eventually to him dying on the cross, his heart was always in a mode of compassion. Always in a mode of compassion. What can I do to resolve this problem and save as many people as possible? What can I do to, to make life better for these people? What can I do to save a world that's gone astray from the rest of my beautiful universe? And he always approached it from the aspect of compassion. So much so that he decided to take the penalty of sin upon himself in order that we might be able to be relieved from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death, annihilation, and a eternal nothingness for us, Jesus decided he would take that upon himself. And today, as we commemorate this event in our communion service, I trust that our hearts will be tending more towards compassion as well, more than towards justice, more than towards equity, more than towards morality, Beyond all of those things, there is a compassion. And that compassion of Jesus is demonstrated by the way we see our fellow men. It's not always easy to feel compassionate towards our fellow men. We see them do some silly things sometimes. We see them take the wrong advice. We see them ignore the good advice that we give them. We see them reject the scripture. We see them reject Jesus. We see them... <coughs> Um, willingly, and sometimes these people are even close to us in our own families, we see them willingly taking the road that will lead to destruction. And it's hard always to feel compassion for them. But today, today, because we're in our church circle here, it's probably a little easier to show compassion, but I want you to think about those who are outside of your church circle here today and see whether or not you have a heart of compassion towards them. Maybe someone way back in the past harmed you uh, terribly, um, wronged you terribly way back in the past. Might have been in business, might have been in social relations, might have been whatever. Um, have you got an attitude of compassion as Jesus had? Um, that's what Jesus wants us to bring today to the service, an attitude of compassion saying, um, what can I do? What can I do to make it easier for that person? to understand what God has in line for them, in mind for them. As we think about Jesus today, let's think about his compassionate attribute, which drove him in every other way to main, so as to maintain his purity so that he would be available to us, so that he would be able to uh, transfer to us something that we don't deserve, and that is an account of our lives, an account of our of our being to the Father, so that he can present us before God as holy and unblameable and unreprovable because he's taken it all upon himself. That's compassion, isn't it? Let's enter into our service today with a compassionate heart. And uh, as we go to wash one another's feet, let's do so with a compassionate spirit, with a heart as soft as Jesus was. 
And let's come back and remember today as we partake of the bread and the wine representing Jesus' body and his spilt blood that Jesus is indeed our compassionate Saviour. Let's bow our heads in prayer in dedication then we can go directly to our foot washing. The ladies just go down the corridor into the room on the left and uh, the men will go through into the hall. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that your compassion has led, led you to allow Jesus to do what he has done, to maintain his holiness and his purity so that he might be uh, adequate to lead us and uh, to direct us and uh, to give us an example of your attitude towards us. We accept your compassion and your mercy and your grace today. We pray that as we fellowship in this communion service, we will do so with softened hearts and that we'll recognize you once again as a compassionate God and Jesus as our compassionate Savior. We pray it please in Jesus' name. Amen. for the Passover service but Jesus took it and gave it a new meaning and uh, the new meaning was uh, that uh, he had fulfilled and would fulfill the promise that he had made to those people years and years ago that he would come and he would be the sacrifice for the sins of the human race and so uh, he uh, took the bread and he broke it up and distributed to his disciples and he says I want you all to be a part of this and so uh, we do it today to symbolize that we want to be a part of it as well. We want to be part of Jesus' kingdom. And the only way we can be part of Jesus' kingdom is to give ourselves over to him, learn about him, learn what he wants, learn what it is to be a citizen of heaven fit to live forever. And so we're going to ask a blessing on this bread so that as we take it, it might uh, stimulate our thoughts and our, and our thinking towards what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He wants us to be that. We're going to bow in prayer. We ask you to bow your heads uh, while we ask uh, Brother Jim to ask a blessing on this bread in this way. Thank you.